Okay, so welcome back everyone for the final <laughs> talk of the day. Uh, we now have uh, Geshe Tashi Tsering. Uh, Geshe Tashi Tsering was born in Tibet in 1958. He studied Buddhism at the Serame Monastic, Monastic University in India for 18 years and was awarded what I'm told is pronounced the Kharampa Geshe degree, but I apologize if I've uh, messed that up. <laughs> this is the equivalent of a Doctorate of Divinity here. Uh, since 1994, he's been a teacher at the Jamyan Buddhist Center in London, uh, where he leads classes, and he also leads classes at other centers in the UK and other countries. He also created the Foundation of Buddhist Thought, uh, which is a two-year Buddhist studies <coughs> course uh, that runs both online and on campus. And this evening, he's going to talk to us about compassion in Buddhist practice. So please give a warm welcome to Geshe Tashitsen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start uh, my talk uh, 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 saying a verse in Tibetan, paying homage to Buddha. I thought, although the, our subject is more uh, academic on this ethics and compassion, but today uh, this gathering is the first gathering on this uh, uh, subject, so I thought it's good to say one short verse in Tibetan, paying homage to the Buddha. Kangi doji nye zone tawa tamje pangbe che tambe chune tunze ba kodam de la cha tse lo And this verse uh, comes from one of the great uh, Indian masters, uh, Nagarjuna, around 2nd century uh, BC. And among his great uh, philosophical uh, texts, uh, one of the most outstanding texts is uh, Mademoga Mula Karika, Sometimes it is translated in English, uh, the fun, uh, fundamental wisdom of the middle way. And uh, this verse that I uh, recited uh, is the last verse uh, from that text. I'll just read in uh, English. There are several different translations. Uh, enthused by great compassion, you expounded the sublime tooth, in order to eliminate all uh, uh, wrong views, to you, the Gautama Buddha, I pay homage. So that is the, uh, the verse which I uh, recited. And uh, very often in the Buddhist traditions, when there are this kind of gathering, uh, starts with the paying homage. Uh, to the Buddha or other great you know, spiritual beings. So that's what I've done. So the, my title, Compassion in uh, Buddhist Practice, I choose Buddhist practice. Uh, practice here uh, mainly, you know, the those, some of those great uh, Western uh, uh, sociologists like Pierre Boto and uh, Michael Foucault, their meaning of practice rather than traditional meaning of practice that is more recitation, meditation, and uh, doing something in a more religious, you know, the, form, but my, my meaning here, practice, is more those uh, Western, you know, the uh, uh, sociologists, their view. You know, the uh, practice in the sense of social beings, like human beings, making and transforming the world where we live 
in other words, practically, you know, physically, verbally, mentally, involving within the communities, within the societies, and uh, you know, the, uh, working for the better for the humanity. Uh, you know, the practice in the sense of uh, dialect with the others, not in a just individually staying, staying quietly in a peaceful environment. So the, my, uh, the title, the practice, uh, the, uh, the, t the term that I choose practice deliberately because I feel, and it seems it is now the, you know, the common understanding, although you know, the, there are many, many great people, people who have titles, people who do not have, have titles, like earlier, uh, one of the example is carers, you know, who are involved in society, in the community, do amazing, great jobs, helping and supporting others. But it seems that we need some kind of, uh, in according to the, in a Foucault's term, we need some kind of discourse, discourses to really to bring up this amazing human potential, you know, the human uh, capability into a more practical level, and uh, not leave it just you know uh, like a carers or parents, or not like that, but also to bring into more academic world to try to explore what kind of potential that we human beings have. And uh, so for that reason, I choose this term, you know, the practice in the, uh, in the title. Then I would like to start uh, my, uh, the talk just uh, this, this verse. Uh, this verse comes from one of the another great Indian uh, Buddhist thinkers, Chandakirti, around seventh century. <coughs> These times, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, the quoting what century is not that that easy. As uh, earlier, I said Nagarjuna around second century. Uh, some of the Western thinkers may disagree with that. Uh, quite difficult to get a very accurate time. So this great uh, thinker, Chandakirti. So he wrote several uh, amazing Buddhist philosophical texts. And this one, uh, the, the supplement to the middle way by Chandakirti. So the supplement to the middle way uh, by Chandakirti it is like a, not really as a commentary, but it, it sort of, you know, giving some detailed explanation, or particularly in some areas where that previous text, which I quoted from Nagarjuna. And this verse is the second verse from the first chapter. There are uh, 10 chapters. <laughs> now my sort of this, uh, yeah, anyway, 10 chapter, I think, yeah. So this comes from the first chapter and the second verse. And this verse emphasize, uh, emphasizes the important, importantness of cultivating or developing compassion, you know, the people who are pursuing the, the spiritual journey in Buddhism. And in particularly here, you know, the, the text belongs to Sanskrit-based uh, Mahayana or Bodhisattvayana uh, teachings. So the people who are pursuing Bodhisattvayana path, for those people, compassion is <coughs> important at the beginning, like the, having a good seed. Compassion is important at the middle, like the water, moistures and other conditions and the compassion is important at the end like a perfectly ripened fruit. 
So although the example here, uh, the analogy is given in a three different uh, th objects like seeds, water, moisture, fully wrapping, perfectly wrapping fruits, but uh, in the meaning, it's talking about the compassion. So here I'm talking uh, my uh, at the present my explanation is more from the soteriological viewpoint. You know, a a person who is attracted to experience or to actualize uh, you know Buddhahood or fully enlightened being, the compassion is important all the way to start. And in the middle, start in the sense of he or she attracted to follow that path due to great compassion. And in the middle, in the sense of while he or she is in the process, in the process of to become a fully awakened being or Buddha, the, the force, the what's called the perseverance to continue that kind of journey is also due to the compassion like water and moisture and also the final you know the when he or she experiences the fully awakened mind it is also due to compassion so now uh, sometimes uh, people uh, you know, the people uh, present the, you know, the aim of the practicing the teachings of the Buddha is like a, attaining or experiencing enlightenment. But uh, for me, experiencing or attaining enlightenment is not the goal. That is the method. That is the means. The means or the methods the goal or the aim is to serve the living beings. Or if I use the literal translation, to benefit all living creatures. That is the goal. He or she attaining enlightenment or experiencing full enlightenment is not the goal. It is the means, methods. So the... Uh, so therefore, you know, this verse, which I, uh, you know, uh, uh, put here, just to, you know, to, uh, to, to explain, you know, the, how the compassion uh, is play a role, you know, or role in the Buddhist, you know, the, particularly in the Bodhisattva uh, path. Mm. But this is more or less what I've explained now. You know, the, just one uh, short explanation that bodhisattva, bodhisattva, that is Sanskrit term. Uh, I'm not Sanskrit expert at all. <laughs> so the uh, bodhisattva refers to very loosely, the term refers to, you know, the practitioners or the people who are more sort of who are more drawn towards uh, not his or her final goal to experience enlightenment, rather, you know, uh, the interest is more all living beings to be, you know, free from dukkha and the origins of dukkha, suffering and the origins of suffering. So that that sort of very very loose. Uh, meaning, the meaning of the Bodhisattva, in case if people who don't know that term, what does that mean, Bodhisattva? <laughs> okay. Now I want to talk a little bit on in our day-to-day -day life, in our everyday life, you know, the, the, the compassion, you know, how the compassion, uh, uh, you know, the play a role in our day-to-day uh, -day life. Mm. It is now quite clear from our own experiences and also, you know, the, uh, from the uh, scientific research, 
you know, the, our survival, our well-being, right at the beginning, the moment we were born, it, it is heavily and if not 100% dependent on others' cares. Others can be our loved mother or parents or, you know, they can be anybody. But our survival, the moment we were born, to survive to the next day or next hour, it is heavily dependent on other people's great kindness, love, and, you know, the uh, cares. And it is also, you know, the clear, you know, the, uh, for us to, uh, you know, to have a good education, to have a good living standards, to have all those what we like to have, it is also heavily dependent on others showing us love, compassion, and so on and so forth. And it is the same at the end, you know, the, when our lives you know, started to, uh, to end, many of us, you know, will heavily depend on other people's care. Without their care, we will suffer a lot. So therefore, you know, if we contemplate that upon ourselves, not just in an academic sort of you know, research, or not just like, you know, blah, 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 but if we reflect on our own lives in these three stages, uh, compassion or love, care, whatever term that we use, is extremely crucial for our survival, well-being, and at also at the end of our life. Now, as a, on this stage, I'm talking about as a, ourselves as a receiver, you know, to receive compassion from others. It is also you know, very, very clear we can, we ourselves, we can give love, compassion to others. It is not just we receive, but also we can give love, compassion, and caring to others. So the, you know, the, uh, yes, so here, you know, the, as a human, first of all, from the Buddhist viewpoint, as a living creatures, and particularly as a human beings and social beings, you know, these mental, uh, amazing mental qualities, love, compassion, tolerance, these are the something most, most important, you know, the sort of uh, elements that ourself as a receiver, ourself as a giver to the others. And I think that's quite, quite clear um, from our own experiences. So then, what is great compassion in Sanskrit, Ma Karuna? And here I have a one uh, verse quotation from, again, another great Indian master, Shantideva, a great, great text called Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. And uh, really, really amazing, uh, nice text. His Holiness, uh, the, the, the Dalai Lama quite often says, you know, the, this text, the, the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, is one of the most outstanding texts if somebody wants to enhance compassion, to be studied, you know, the, to in, in, enhance compassion. And in that uh, text, in the chapter 8, verse 110, that, uh, that verse, therefore, to the extent that I protect myself from disparagement, so shall, uh, so shall I generate a spirit of protection <coughs> and a spirit of compassion towards uh, others. So this verse gives us 
two things. Uh, so that uh, the, the verse started saying, therefore, uh, earlier some verses, uh, earlier verses were explaining or, you know, uh, explaining the, the, the importantness, the importantness of understanding. Here the term is used disparagement or you can use, you know, the difficulties or if we use the Buddhist term in Sanskrit, dukkha, uh, in Tibetan suffering, uh, sorry, in Tibetan uh, dungel, and quite often Western scholars not to, uh, don't want to translate, uh, you know, le want to leave that term as it is, dukkha, because you know, the word has a very rich meaning. So therefore, you know, uh, or suffering, if we uh, uh, translate, sometimes some uh, translate saying suffering or dukkha, uh, suffering or you know, dissatisfaction. So for the uh, Buddhist practitioner, you know, to want to practice compassion, love, it is extremely important he or she need to understand dukkha, need, you know, the suffering, dissatisfaction. Now here, earlier, uh, you know, almost all the previous speakers talk about, you know, the, how important is it oneself just to show empathy that oneself, you know, the, how, how, uh, you know, how important it is that oneself to understand dukkha or suffering or not. Now the Buddhist understanding without uh, uh, without the understanding of dukkha or suffering it is very very difficult to show you know the uh, empathy or sympathy <laughs> whatever term that we use to others. And because of that Buddha himself said in his first teachings, after his enlightenment, he said, this noble truth of suffering or dukkha is to be fully understood. So for the Buddhist practitioner to enhance or to cultivate dukkha, uh, compassion or love, it is extremely important to understand dukkha, suffering. Now here, dukkha, suffering should not be, you know, the, uh, should not be understood only surface, physical difficulties. In the Buddhist literatures, dukkha or suffering is explained in many different layers, many different levels of dukkha. Some of, some of those dukkhas we may not perceive as a dukkha. Instead, we may perceive as a desirable. But in reality, according to the teachings of the Buddha, they are dukkha, suffering. So this, you know, the understanding, the understanding of dukkha, uh, suffering, in order to enhance what you call the uh, compassion or love within ourselves, and to show, you know, to to show our compassion and love to others is something extremely important, according to the you know the Buddhist uh, teachings. Hmm? Now, uh, here the in the Buddhist traditions, compassion or love. Compassion and love that uh, we, you know, these can be uh, enhanced, these can be, uh, or if I use other term, further develop. Uh, so this is something which I want to explore a little bit later. Now first, when we talk about compassion, love, uh, tolerance, these mental uh, 
uh, amazing mental states or mental qualities. In terms of the their seed, in terms of the their you know the their seeds or their you know the uh, potentials, according to the teachings of the Buddha, we all we all have the potential, the seed, to to have a you know the uh, fully cultivated, fully developed compassion. And here, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, in his this uh, text, uh, this book, you know, this book, he talks about uh, two kinds of, two levels of compassion, biological level and the enhanced level. As far as biological levels of compassion is concerned, that we all have, particularly if we look at the mother, carrying her child, her children, you know, that's more like a biological, biologically that we have this ability to show a degree, degrees of compassion to others. However, that kind of compassion is more quite often, you know, not what's called the uh, uh, <coughs> equal, unable to have to others, apart from her children, apart from her loved ones. So the, the second one, the in a enhanced level of compassion. And this uh, enhancement or development of compassion, uh, according to the teachings of the Buddha, or <coughs> according to the uh, Buddhist, Buddhist teachings, which, you know, the we human beings are extremely capable in terms of the internally and culturally and from our own experiences, unlike other social you know, the animals. Because you know, the internally, we have a tremendous, uh, you know, the extremely rich emotions. And same time, we, has, we have amazingly sophisticated intelligence. Here, when I used emotion and intelligence, I'm using more like a emotion in the sense of, you know, the, the more like a, uh, you know, the, what you call the, because at the first I will say a few words on this. Emotion, that English word, we do not have equivalent to that word we do not have in Tibetan. You know, that because it seems for me, the English term emotion, I might be wrong, it seems for me it covers positive as well as negative. It is like that. So the, in Tibetan, we do not have that kind of word which covers both that levels of the mind. I don't know in Sanskrit, but in Tibetan, we do not have. Uh, closest term that we have is tsoatapo. That means, you know, a strong feeling. That's only we have, close to the emotion. So, uh, but I, here I'm using the term emotion uh, simply to contrast that our ability to think, you know, more in a in a sort of calculative level, more in a you know, the investigative level. So contrast with that kind of mind, I'm using the term emotion. So anyway, we are extremely rich in that levels of the mind, and also we are extremely, you know, sophisticated to think, not just the present, also the past, and also the future. And also we have thousands of years of culture as earlier, you know, the uh, father, you know, uh, Reverend Father Richard talked about, you know, the, in Christianity and so forth. And these are the cultures that we have, you know. The, and uh, so, therefore, human beings are, you know, the extremely, uh, what's called, in terms of the richness, we are extremely rich to enhance this amazing mind. 
at, the, at this level, maybe we may have just biological level. This biological level of compassion can be enhanced without any bias, without any discrimination, you know, by using our experiences, our intelligence, and our deep, you know, the rich emotions. So that is what, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the some kind of base or some kind of foundation, uh, which, uh, you know, the, uh, in this, yeah, in this context. Now then, I want to, I want to uh, give a small example how important it is to, 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 to have a genuine sense of empathy or sympathy towards others, you know, the, uh, to, to have that kind of empathy, genuine empathy, how important it is to understand dukkha or suffering that other person is uh, going through. Recently, on BBC Three, there is a, a program, program which is called uh, Free Speech. It is, you know, a a, a sort of debate, uh, debating current issues. And on uh, 21st of October, there was uh, the the current issue affair uh, was about mental, you know, the mental health, mental health. And the, in that debate, there are four panels, panelists, and uh, it seems they all, you know, the, had mental difficulties and, you know, come out from that difficulties, or they are still in that kind of mental difficulties. Um, all, all of them are having some kind of titles, you know, either television presenter or, you know, the book writer, politicians, there are four. And then I think there might be about 100 audience. And it is almost unanimous from the, from the you know, panelists and also from the audience. They said, due to themselves had experienced mental illness or are experiencing mental illness, that helped them to understand other people who are going through mental difficulties because of they themselves went through that kind of difficulties. Now here, I'm not saying, I'm not saying in order to, you know, have a strong, genuine empathy to somebody who is going through difficulties, that person who, you know, express empathy, he or she must go the exactly the same kind of difficulties. No. What is here we are talking about? Understanding. Not necessarily experiencing the, the suffering, the difficulties, but understanding. These two are quite different. As Buddha himself said earlier that in my quotation, dukkha should be fully understood. So the understanding the nature of dukkha is quite different from experiencing the dukkha or suffering. So the, that is something, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 I thought it quite important to look at that one. Then the another point I want to make here is, uh, as earlier speakers, they talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, whether compassion, feeling of feeling compassion is same as feeling uh, pitiful or pity to somebody. Now again, the words, these are uh, English words, not my first language, so it's quite difficult to, you know, really to get f real feeling when I use these terms. In the, according to the Buddhist literatures, when somebody, uh, you know, genuinely, sincerely uh, experiences compassion towards others, there's no any there's no sense of that those others are some kind of belittled or you know the pitiful. Not at all. Instead, 
there is a tremendous sense of, you know, the, what you call the uh, importance, those others. Not in a pitiful, but ra you know, rather these are important beings. So that, uh, that is uh, part of the, you know, the, yeah. Now then, Next, uh, so the next one here, uh, as I uh, said earlier briefly, you know, Buddhists believe every living creature, particularly every human being, has the seed to produce great compassion. Now here I want to talk a little bit about this, uh, the, uh, the great, <coughs> uh, great compassion, great compassion. So the term compassion in the Buddhist literature uh, comes in a several different, use of several different versions. Compassion, uh, immeasurable compassion, uh, great compassion, you know, or just in a very basic term, uh, just empathy, just empathy. And the great compassion here, uh, and uh, uh, also, the, in general, you know, the compassion, uh, uh, according to the teachings of the Buddha, it is not just having, uh, have, uh, being able to show some kind of empathy to somebody. Genuine compassion, and particularly here, great compassion, in that mental state, there should not be any kind, any sense of bias. It should be free from bias. Whoever, whoever comes in front of you have the same feeling, the same sort of response, empathy. Whoever, without any discrimination. And that is something uh, only will become, only will have through deliberately, you know, uh, enhancing that mind, not naturally. We do not have that kind of natural, naturally, to show that empathy to everybody. And, uh, you know, the, so the great compassion. And uh, here are listed three sort of uh, uh, methods, three methods. Uh, cultivation of four you know, immeasurables, and that includes immeasurable compassion. And the uh, uh, last two, seven point cause and effect, which is uh, one of the methods, uh, you know, the, some of the great Indian masters like Nagarjuna, which I mentioned earlier, they applied. And also there's another method called exchanging oneself with the others. And uh, one of the main obstacles to enhance compassion or great compassion is the self-centered mind. Self-centered mind. You know, the, as long as self-centered mind is within us, it is impossible us to have, you know, the unconditional compassion towards, you know, the every or anybody, you know, towards all living creatures. So this, uh, the second, the seven point cause and effect method and exchanging oneself with, other, uh, with others, these two methods are, you know, purely designed to deal with the self-centered mind. Uh, particularly the, the last one, exchanging oneself with the others, that text which I mentioned earlier, that's 7th century uh, great Indian master, Shantideva, Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, in that text, you know, the, it is very beautifully explained how to deal with the self-centered mind in order to enhance great compassion within ourselves. Mm. 
Okay. Do I have time? Uh, well, you, we've got sort of uh, 10 ish okay. minutes to go, which That's can good. either go to questions or to more. As, okay. As you okay, then I'll, 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 I'll finish it off. Yeah. Now, uh, those earlier two or three methods which I mentioned, listed, these, are, uh, these methods are initially uh, enhanced by meditation, by meditation. I don't want to contradict what I said earlier. You know, the here I want to talk compassion more in the practice rather than on the meditation cushion. But the initial, initial enhancement, compassion or love, are through meditation. And this verse, again, you know, the, uh, the same, uh, this great Indian master, Shantideva, uh, due to habituation, there is a sense that, the, my main point here is that due to habituation, habituation, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to talk here, this, that, uh, that term, uh, uh, relation to the meditation, meditation. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt nowadays in the West, you know, the, uh, uh, there are more and more people have a better understanding about, you know, Eastern uh, meditation. What is meditation? Nevertheless, still there are, you know, the many uh, misunderstanding what is methods, uh, um, what is meditation. I think one reason is meditation become extremely fashionable. So therefore, you know, people use the term in a very loose way and in many different ways. So now here the meditation is actually, it is a tool. It is a, men it is a tool that uh, use, uh, to use our mental, you know, the uh, mental state. Certain mental states to enhance that we would like to enhance, and certain, certain mental states that we would like to reduce, minimize, use the meditation to minimize or to reduce. So meditation is a tool. It's a tool. It is used for many different purposes, mainly for, to do with the mental, uh, mental level. Mental level. Uh, just I want to, uh, recently, the, uh, I think 22nd of October, in the New York, uh, New York Times, there is an article written by Bruce uh, Gerson. And his article uh, itself is called, What If Age is Nothing But a, uh, but a Mindset? That's the uh, title of the article. He's dealing with the aging, you know, the aging. And uh, his uh, uh, article is mainly based on one of the great sort of, uh, I was told, uh, 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 you know, the professor in Harvard uh, University uh, in the psych uh, psychology department, Alan Langer. Langer. And in that article, there is a one uh, short paragraph, which I want to read that. And uh, this will give, you, give us a little bit, uh, you know, things to talk. Linger's technique of achieving a state of mindfulness is different from the one often utilized, utilized in Eastern mindfulness meditation. Then there is this uh, you know, saying, non-judgmental awareness of the thought and the feelings drifting through your mind. That is and uh, uh, that is everywhere today. Her emphasis on nothing. Uh, her her emphasis on noticing moment to moment. So then he carries on how this professor's method to enhance, you know, the some certain mental states in order to uh, in order to uh, what you call the uh, you know not necessarily stop, but. Uh, you know, the, not to enhance aging, uh, you know, very fast. So now here, point what I'm making here is the writer sort of, you know, blankly said meditation, medita in the Eastern, 
you know, mindfulness meditation, non-judgmental uh, awareness uh, of the thoughts. I think that might be true in a certain type of Eastern mindfulness meditation. But it, it, it is not true many, many other Eastern meditations. In fact, you know, if we want to apply a, a powerful meditation, in that meditation needs tremendous sense of thinking, analysis, or if we use the, some of the academic terms, critical analysis. <coughs> Without that, it is impossible to, you know, to, to really such as the self-centeredness to be reduced. So this, you know, the uh, meditation. So the, uh, you know, the tool, quite often, the meditation in the West nowadays just only uh, talk about mindfulness. That is the one, just cultivating one mental quality to have a, you know, the mindfulness. The meditation in the East, in Buddhism and also other Eastern religion, in the Indian religion, is used for, to cultivate many, many other mental qualities like compassion, like love and understanding. And to medit med use the meditation as a tool to enhance these uh, mental qualities, just simple, you know, the, what you call the thoughtless or non-judgmental non awareness will not do the job, needs critical thinking. So I want to, just want to finish my last point. Is this my conclusion? Is this? I will more or less read it that. <laughs> so His Holiness the Dalai Lama strongly emphasizes the need in modern world for compassion based secular ethics. So last 15, 20 years, His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, you know, advocates that we need you know, some kind of education to the new generations to enhance their moral responsibility, moral responsibility in the sense of thinking others' needs and others' feelings, others' rights, not all the time me, me, me. And to, to, to bring that kind of Aware, raise that kind of awareness, particular, although world religious traditions, major world religious traditions, had, you know, contributed to the world, you know, to bring, to make a, you know, peaceful, uh, you know, the, uh, what's called the, you know, the, uh, 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 peaceful, you know, the community and the societies, and so on and so forth, and will contribute in the future. However, you know, the more than half, more than one and a half billion human beings on this planet are non-believer. And uh, of course, they have tremendous sense of, you know, the, within that non-believer, they, they live their life, majority, they live their life, you know, the very ethically and uh, have a tremendous sense of, uh, you know, the uh, awareness to the other's well-being. Nevertheless, we need uh, some kind of, you know, the, uh, what you call the uh, understanding of moral ethic that all human beings to look, you know, the, to live with that, to practice with that, and that is what His Holiness Dalai Lama is advocating last, you know, 15, 20 years, and uh, at the same time, as I said earlier, you know the. Uh, in the Buddhist literature, Buddhist, you know, the scriptures um, uh, have tremendous, have very rich explanation about minds, thoughts, emotions, in other words, our mental world. I'm not saying the 
you know, <laughs> other traditions that don't have, but uh, Buddhist teachings have it. really, really rich traditions. And many of those texts are still, although some, some of those texts are written in you know, first, second century, but still they are you know, used in the Buddhist world to, you know, the, in, in their, uh, to benefit in their daily lives. So therefore, you know, the Buddh- uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhism can contribute you know, to the world to, to, uh, you know, to, to enhance that kind of oneness as a human beings, not us and them, but the saying us, human humanity as a one. So thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for another great talk. We, we, since we started 10 minutes late, we'll, we'll go on 10 minutes over uh, uh, before we get to our wine uh, for any questions that, that there are. So, oh, Samuel, yes, do go ahead. I was very interested. Thank you very much for that. I was, I was, it was extremely interesting. I was very interested in particular um, in what you said regarding the um, the end of uh, the process being the uh, uh, serving others yes. and uh, enlightenment merely being a means to that, which yeah. is not how I had understood the British, British tradition previously, so it's very interesting to me. Um, but I wonder if that, it, does that imply that uh, were enlightenment not the best way to um, serve others, then enlightenment would not be what, uh, what uh, the Buddhist tradition would advocate? Is it merely a contingent fact that mm. this is what we, ought to, uh, what we ought to cultivate? Okay. Now here, in the process of experiencing enlightenment or attaining enlightenment, some people don't like attaining, so experiencing enlightenment is really enhancing or cultivating that altruistic mind and the wisdom. It is not, you know, the, uh, a person A to become person B when he or she experiences enlightenment. Actually, it is the person A's, those skillful means, to reach out to others, those mental strengths, you know, and the wisdom. That is the process. When you say working to experience enlightenment, it is the process to enhance those mental states and through the mental, uh, mental qualities, then he, you know, to act or to reach out to the others. So it is a, you know, the these, uh, yeah, I think that will. I'll, so now, the, the earlier there was a, some uh, some kind of indication saying that when we experience compassion or great compassion, we may have sense of fear. We may experience sense of fear, sense of uh, losing one's own sort of you know the. Uh, whatever we've got. According to the Buddhist understanding, you know, the cultivation of these mental qualities, like compassion, uh, oneself is not the loser. You know, say the altruistic or compassion. Although, you know, altruistically, compassionately, we may give some material to others, we, we, so our material may get less, but uh, mentally, we are not, you know, the uh, poorer. So that, anyway, that, yeah, that's not direct to <laughs> relate to your question. <laughs> I believe there's a question back there. Yep. Hello. Okay. Um, so you said that you don't need to go through the same experiences as people in order to um, feel compassion. Yes. Um, and you just need to understand dukkha or the yes. suffering yes. Um, so does that mean that suffering is the same for everyone so it's understandable because it's relatable okay now at the, in the, uh, at the surface you know the 
our difficulties may differ. You know, the, uh, but the Buddhist understanding about what we call, the, you know, the, uh, in English it's translated pervasive suffering, the third levels of dukkha. Dukkha is, you know, uh, listed in uh, many different levels, but one way to list is suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and pervasive suffering. As far as pervasive suffering, level of the pervasive suffering is concerned, according to the Buddhist teachings, all living beings are same, suffering the same things. And usually I joke when, when I lead these kind of classes. I say, you know, the uh, English Queen, Queen Isabel II, and the, you know, the homeless uh, on the street, as far as that levels of suffering is concerned, experiencing same. Of course, you know, the, in, the, in the surface level, it's different. Okay, well, it seems like we might have uh, uh, exhausted you yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, with so many talks. However, I believe at least some of our speakers will still be around for a little while after we finish off. So if you come up with anything you would like to ask, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to attempt to give you an answer if you manage to catch them. Uh, could we have another round of applause for uh, Dr. Tashi Jones? <laughs> Dr. Tashi Jones. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tashi Jones. <laughs> and I, I think either I or Alex ought to say thank you to all our speakers and, and to Blackfriars. Shall I? Well, thank you to all our speakers <laughs> and to Blackfriars. <laughs> <laughs>